Why does your dog bark at the mailman? Well, if the dog is barking and the mailman leaves, that dog is reinforced that they moved that mailman. (laughs) They got the cheeseburger. They got the payday. If we go back to the root purpose of why a Shih Tzu would be barking at the window, Shih Tzus are not attack dogs. So that's why you're not getting a dog running out there biting. Shih Tzus are alert dogs. So what your dog wants you to do is come over, look out the window and literally say, I see it. Thank you. And walk away calmly. If you throw some kibble in another room and go sit back down, nine times out of 10, your dog will stop barking and calm down immediately. They literally just want you to acknowledge the thing. Okay. So you shouldn't be yelling at them. Correct. Because then you're barking with them. Think about it that way. (laughs) Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher, Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A-OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD. Your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you, too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Well, hello there. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. Thank you so much for joining me here for episode number 182 of ADHD for Smartass Women. I hope that you'll subscribe to this podcast and our newsletter over at tracyoutsuka.com. You know my purpose. It's always to show you who you are and then inspire you to be it. So again, in the thousands of ADHD women that I've had the privilege of meeting, I've never met a one that wasn't truly brilliant at something, not one. And so for all of these reasons, I am just delighted to introduce you to Renee Smith. Renee Hello. is a- <laughs> Hi there. Welcome. <laughs> so Renee is a professional dog trainer who specializes in reactive and aggressive dogs. She is a certified canine behavior consultant through the Certification Council for Professional Dog Trainers, and she received her training and education from the Animal Behavioral Wait, Animal Behavior College. Renee has 10 dogs of her own and she's a single mom, not in that order. <laughs> <laughs> COVID moved her business to virtual consulting, which is when she really narrowed her specialization to help owners with their reactive and aggressive dogs in a way that is considerate of both the dog and the human's needs. So welcome, Renee. It is so nice to finally meet you. Hey, yeah, it's nice to be on here. I feel like we're already friends, but I was just saying. We are. We are. So before we talk about all stuffed dogs... Can we talk about your ADHD diagnoses first? Yeah, absolutely. It's funny because the this podcast is actually part of my journey. So I was wonderful. In, yeah, I was in trauma therapy, another round of it, and I ended up going to EMDR therapies. And as we were getting to the root of some things, she looked at me and said, "Have you ever been tested for ADHD?" <laughs> I'm like, "What? No." And so, when did this happen? Like, how long ago? Uh, this was maybe halfway through the year last year, maybe beginning of this year, like pretty recently. Wow. Wow. Okay. And was it light bulbs or was it like, are you kidding me? What? No. I was very confused at first. Yeah. I was like, there's no way. Like I'm not the stereotypical whatever you picture. I thought I was more autistic than anything, (laughs) but I assumed that was just from my PTSD. So, you know, I love one of your episodes. You said you have to get through your trauma first. 
And it was so important that it came in that order for me, I think, you know? So Um, what do you think that your therapist saw while she's working um, with you through the trauma that made her think, huh, I think it might be ADHD. Maybe you need to get tested for this. I have no idea. She just (laughs) happened to mention it in passing one day and was like, can we just take these questions? I was like, yeah, sure. You can ask me questions. And I answered them all. She's like, okay, so I think you need to talk to your psych about this. What Mm -hmm. the heck? So I went through the whole journey through the VA, which makes it a little bit extra spicy. And I had my therapist and my psych that I had to get on board. But we eventually did. And I started some meds and... Oh man, just starting with the releasing of the thought that I'm broken, trying to fit into everybody else's lifestyle has been a game changer. Wow. So she said, let's, let's look at ADHD. She walked you through the screener and then you went home and what were you thinking? Did you have any clue? Did she explain to you what ADHD looks like in women? No, she did not. So... I, true to ADHD form, hyperfixated on it and came home and learned everything I could in the next 24 hours. <laughs> and so um, when you were doing that, was it like a light bulb went off and you were just convinced that, oh my gosh, this is what's been going on with me? Yeah, it wasn't until honestly, like the stuff I was finding didn't really seem to match me until I started talking to other people with ADHD, until I started like your podcast or I joined a couple of Facebook groups and I realized that is what I was before my trauma. So it is the root of who I am. Does that make uh, sense? Yeah. Okay. So what were you like as a child? I was bubbly, social butterfly, all of the things. I think my ADHD kicked in through that um, middle school years. Mm, so which is, my mom, which is typical because of hormones right? and puberty. Yep. It's a real thing. I didn't know mm-hmm. this, but. I'm in school, I'm straight A's, and then all of a sudden my mom asks me, what's the, so if we're going 60 miles an hour on the highway, how long is it going to take us to go 60 miles? And I could not answer her. I was just memorizing. I wasn't actually processing anything I was learning. So she mm-hmm. pulled me from school and homeschooled me for a year. Oy. And when I came back, I had restructured how I learned and was able to go into schooling again. Ah, so her pulling you out and helping you put a structure together that worked for your brain, that was actually quite helpful. Yep. And it made me learn how I learn. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) It was a great move. I'm really grateful for it. And so then what happened in school? So you would have been in, was it like seventh or eighth grade? Yeah, I was pulled to seventh grade for homeschool. I went back eighth grade and then Uh straight off into high school. Um, My grades were, I mean, average. I was three, seven, three, eight. That's not Um, average, Renee. (laughs) That is not average. That is okay. such an ADHD comment. <laughs> At <laughs> we my don't school, even it was when we're excelling, you know. <laughs> At my school, it was. You have to understand. I had a three seven, and I graduated bottom third of my class. Oh my word! So where did you grow up? Colorado. Okay. And so, so were the yeah. schools where you went to school? Were the schools really good? Yeah, there was a. A lot of the AP courses. So a lot of people graduated with over 4.0s. We had several full rides to the Ivy Leagues. One of the girls just actually won the gold medal in the Olympics. Hmm. Right. There was something in the Skiing? water that year. <laughs> no, discus. <laughs> ah, I don't yeah. even know what discus is. Is that you're like throwing something, right? <laughs> yeah, it looks almost like those heavy Frisbees. Ah, okay. I was thinking of like a weight. <laughs> oh, yeah. They are like eight pounds, I think. Don't quote me on that. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, but yeah, so my grades are pretty average. (laughs) Um, Did you have to work hard for them? Absolutely. So my French teacher would lay down my test and a box of tissues with a chocolate because I could not understand French to save my life. (laughs) Have you ever been tested for dyslexia? I have not, but listening to your son's journey. Yep. I think there's something to that. Uh Uh-huh. Well, that's, you know, one of the subjects that um, I know for him, he was allowed to, I don't know what it's called, like legally and, you know, what the universities call it, but he was allowed to waive foreign language. Now, the most interesting thing, though, Renee, is that, you know, he was raised with um, a Spanish-speaking nanny. Mm -hmm. She worked with us part-time, but 
she did such a great job that she was actually um, his godmother. She's become Aww. part of our family. She's yeah. a fantastic, uh, you know, human. And because of that, she spoke Spanish to him all the time. And so nice. Spanish, he's fluent, never had a problem, but all the other languages he really, really struggles in. And that's one of the, you know, one of the indicators of, I guess, dyslexia. So I, I whenever I hear someone, you know, mm-hmm. tell me that they really struggled in a foreign language, because think about it, if you're struggling to learn how to read in English, Of course, it's going to be compounded, right? The problems in a different language. Well, and I looked like a really good reader because I always read all the time, Mm. but I was just skimming. I could read a whole book in a day, just quick skimming everything. Yep, exactly. So they assumed I knew what I was doing. And I was like, sure, this is reading, I guess, and went through. (laughs) But then I was also in track. I went to state all four years. I was in orchestra. I went to tri-state orchestra competitions. (laughs) I played in musicals. I worked a job starting my sophomore year. And I got my CNA credentials before I graduated. What's CNA credentials? CNA, so a certified nurse's aide. Oh my God. CNA. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Wow. So you were very accomplished and busy. Right. I did a lot. Yeah. I was a volunteer. I did all of the things. So looking back, I overcompensated with all my extracurriculars because I wanted Mm -hmm. my grades to not look like such a big deal. Well, and they were easy for you, right? Right. I never did my homework. (laughs) One of the things that I've I, I've really seen this um, oh what what is the word that I'm looking for this well it, it's about being consistently inconsistent and it just follows suit where I see so many people with ADHD who struggle in school but then outside of school they're so accomplished or they're just amazing employees you know there mm-hmm. there's always seems to be a balance and yeah. it doesn't make sense that you'd work so hard in all those other areas and then not be working hard in school. It's just that sometimes we work really hard and we have nothing to show for it in school. Exactly. My procrastination skills were awful. Like I could not, to save my life, do the school thing. Yeah, Um, it was hard. It was hard. Yeah, like it was was easy to do what they wanted me to do, but it was hard to actually understand what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So that was So what happened after school? So chaos, life got crazy on me. I ended up joining the army about a year or so after I graduated high school. Wow. Um, and I went in as a lab tech. So it says, I say lab tech, like it's no big deal. It's a 75% washout rate in the army for the schooling because it's a year long schooling. And in six months you get 60 credit hours. And so what exactly, so you're, you didn't go in after college. You went in after high school. Yes, ma'am. Wow. Okay. And so what does a lab tech actually do? So, you know, when you get your blood drawn and then it gets sent to the back for testing, we do all the testing. I would get blood ready for surgeries. I would read blood. I would read urinalysis, chemistries. Was that hard, the program, or was that easy for you? Um, I had a lot going on at the time, but I was able to stuff an enormous amount of information in my brain for short periods of time. Mm -hmm. typical fashion. It was very well set up for the ADHD brain. Ah, and why was that? Well, so for example, we did a whole college chem class one, like college chem one. We did it in a month. Oh, gosh. Right. (laughs) You get the whole textbook in front of you and you have one month to learn all the things and you only get four tests. So if you fail out, they send you to a different uh, MOS, a different job. Mm. So I would literally be able to memorize everything in time for that test at the end of the week and forget it all and make room for the next set of information. Mm. So it never really built on top of each other? Right. But you were still able to get through it. Yep. I suspect, though, that a lot of people who end up in the Army, especially that young, probably are people who struggled in school too, huh? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So So did that for a while. Was that job hard? Did you enjoy it? Yes and no. Um, I liked my job when I was active duty. I was actually doing burn research. So Ooh. that was really interesting. Um, the hours were long. And then when I got medically retired out, I tried civilian side for several years. And it just, there was no sunlight. <laughs> there was mm. no sunlight. It didn't keep my attention. I preferred to work by myself so that I could run all of the different departments by myself. That way it was challenging. So when you say there is no sunlight, do you literally mean like there's no nature and that 
was what was uh, really problematic for you? Yeah, like you're literally in the back of the hospital. There's maybe they had like a little sliver of a window to look outside, but then that even got covered with stuff. So I would go to work for eight plus hours when I was working night shift. I would never see the sun. Mm. Wow. Didn't work for me. I need the sun. So then I had babies. I had two children at the time. Um, that's when I started collecting my dogs as well. And you have 10 of them? I have 10 now, yes. I used to have 14. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so before we get into the whole dog thing, which I'm really (laughs) looking forward to, I'd like to know, once you knew it was ADHD, just to kind of wrap up this part, and you had Mm -hmm. the benefit of hindsight, what are some of the symptoms that you always wondered about, but now you recognize them as, duh, it was clearly ADHD? Not being able to think unless I'm moving. For example, I couldn't ever do anything stationary, but now that I've embraced that part, I just sit on a yoga ball and I can get everything done. I stand on a balance board while I'm at the computer. I can get everything done. Would you get Um, in trouble in school um, for moving too much or? I was usually too tired from doing so many other things. I mean, I would stay at school for four to six hours working out if I wasn't working at my job, rollerblading two miles to get there. Okay. And so that's <laughs> how you managed it. Right. That's how I manage it with extreme exercise. Sure. Okay. Okay. Anything and else? the other big one was I gave myself some grace with my alcoholism and my addiction. Mm. Actually, I am six years sober. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. But I was able to kind of look back on it and understand why I fell into it so fast. So I was self-medicating. You s- Yeah, exactly. And so Mm -hmm. when you say fell into it so fast, was this in high school? It was right when I graduated. Yeah, Mm -hmm. within about a year, year and a half, I needed hospitalization. I was in a bad way. So I'm really glad I'm out of that. But it's taken years and years of multiple different types of therapies. (laughs) And so when you look at all of this, do you think that the primary root is just you had a different brain? Yeah. Like if I had been taught how to regulate and how to balance back in high school, Mm -hmm. it would have been fine. If somebody had taught me how to problem solve the way my brain needed problem solving, because our brains problem solve differently than other people's brains. Yeah. Yeah. So are do you have siblings or are you um, an only child? I do. I'm the oldest of five. Oh, wow. And (laughs) do any of them share your brain? Um. My younger sister, no, she's very type A, has achieved amazing things in her life. Kudos to her. Very proud of her. She's already a nurse and having her first baby. She's awesome. Um, My three younger siblings, they're still out in Colorado. But I think, I think my oldest brother might be somewhere with the ADHD world. And my sister between them, she's got some, some psych issues. But my younger brother, I don't know much of. Mm. Well, I'm really glad that you figured out that it was ADHD. I mean, I can clearly, I can just hear how smart you are and how much you've you've already accomplished, even though I bet you don't think it's enough. Well, no, I haven't actually completed anything. I just started. (laughs) No, but you have. And this is something that I hear from ADHD, women especially, all the time. But the deal is you can't, how, can I ask you how old you are? I am 27. Oh my God, Renee, (laughs) you've done so much. And the thing is, you can't see how it's all connected just yet because you're so young. But I promise you, when you get a little bit more years on you and you look backwards, it's all going to come together and it's going to make sense why you had every single one of those experiences and you did what you did, right, at that particular time. So I agree 100%. Without what I had gone through, I wouldn't be where I'm at. 100%. No, no. Okay, so let's talk about the thing that I'm super excited to talk about. (laughs) So out of all the things you can decide to do with dogs, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you choose to become an expert in aggressive and reactive dogs. Mm -hmm. And on one hand, that sounds super ADHD. But I got to tell you, on the other hand, it sounds so terrifying. It takes someone really special to do this kind of work. And I will tell you personally, anxious and aggressive dogs and I do not mesh well. And I think, and I've had experience with it. I think we wind each other up. And because Mm -hmm. I am not naturally calm, I'm already wound up. The dog reads that in me. So 
I've had a million dogs. Most of them have been very friendly. We raised a guide dog for the blind and, you know, we've had a couple golden retrievers, which is honestly my favorite breed just because they wake up so happy. They trust everyone and they work, they walk around believing the world is their oyster. Like they want to please you. Uh, We also had a shy, sharp Doberman which is why I ended up with my first golden retriever because it was a way for me to, you know, make the Doby seem more chill because, oh, he, oh, you know, when two dogs are running at you and one's a Doberman and one's a golden retriever, you're like, well, that's his buddy. So he must be okay. <laughs> he must not be that bad. <laughs> I was also attacked by my little shit bulldog Buster when he went doggy senile a couple of years ago. I was yeah. in wound care for several months and we ended up having to put him down because- oh, yeah. It was kind of the second time he'd done it. He had tried it with my husband. It gets bad um, fast. And it was it was a bad bite to the foot. And I would have gotten another golden after that because they're so easy, but my husband's allergic to dogs. <laughs> so we ended up with this little Shisu. She's sitting right here. Um, her name's Mochi. I call her Mo. And she's really good with people, but she does not trust other dogs. You know, she was raised during COVID, so she wasn't well socialized. She's got one dog friend, but she's just really dominant. And she's been like that pretty much from a year on, you know, she was a little puppy and she was bossing around much bigger and older dogs. And even when you hold her, she's so dominant, you can barely get her on her back. You know, she'll fight you. She'll kick until, you know, she's right side up. But what I realize is rather than dominant, she seems like, I think she's just really anxious And I'm always saying, you know, she's ADHD because she notices everything. And once she notices it, she can't let it go. Um, And once she's wound up, I can't unwind her. So, for example, if she hears the Federal Express truck, you know, the wheels on the gravel road driving up to our home, she just loses it. And there's absolutely nothing I can do to calm her down. She she starts shaking and running to the door and she acts like she's going to kill the guy. But if you open the front door and let her out, She's licking him and she won't let him go, right? She, it's just this reactive pattern that she's gotten into. Yep. Um, and unfortunately, or I guess it's fortunately because she's really good with people, but if we're out and about and there's another dog, I get so anxious because I get anxious about what she's going to do because she's 14 pounds and she has no concept about you know, which dogs are just big loves and which ones might actually kill her. So she's super bold. She acts out and ultimately she acts super tough, but it's because she's scared of these dogs. Right. And it's like she was traumatized, but I don't know how, and I don't know when, and I don't know how to teach her how to pause and calm herself down, which, you know, would be an ADHD strategy that I could use for myself if I was anxious about something. And so I'm just dying to know, because I've talked on and on and on here, (laughs) but I'm dying to know, how did you get into this area and how do you do it without, it just seems so scary, Renee. Yeah, I know. So uh, I did it in true ADHD form. I'll say it that (laughs) way. (laughs) Um, I started with the idea, I had just gotten out of the army. So I was like, save everything. And I was getting sober and just started collecting dogs, you know, oh, that pit bull needs a new home. And so why, can I ask you, why were you collecting dogs? What is it about dogs that you clearly love so much? Yeah, well, at the time I was actually going to try and train them to be service dogs for other veterans with PTSD. That was my goal. It kind of resonated with me as a person to rehabilitate a pound dog and turn it into a service dog. That was my initial direction in life or Mm -hmm. my thought. And then I didn't realize what I didn't know. We don't know what we don't know. And I ended up um, ended up in the middle of a, a seven dog pit bull pack fight in the middle of my living room while I was pregnant. Wait, 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 wait. What? <laughs> what? Yeah. Um, one of my females, we found out later she was having behavioral seizures, but she turned around and started trying to kill one of my puppies. And then there's this thing called social drift, which I have now learned about. Um, but it's also called like a a pack frenzy where if one dog hears another dog screaming, they all just kind of jump into it. So my dogs ended up splitting into two groups, one group of females, one group of males. And I was like crawling between the two, trying to separate them. I got bit. They all got bit. It was a disaster. Oh my God. And Renee, 
this is what sends you into the path doing this for a living? What the hell? Yeah, I know. I know. I showed up to meet my mentor because I was in that ABC school. So I'd only done the book learning stuff. So I <laughs> show up to meet my mentor like a week later. And I just look like Swiss cheese and I'm pregnant. I'm third trimester pregnant. <laughs> I'm very pregnant. Oh my and gosh. she's told me basically I had two options at the time because of the amount of damage done to each other and to me. One of my dogs grabbed me by my leg and drug me off. So, oh my God. Right. The amount of damage, the amount of intensity involved. Yeah. And the fact that it was their first ever episode and it went straight to there. Yeah. Um, she recommended that I have two choices either start euthanizing them or become an aggression expert. Okay. So I became an aggression expert um, and I started rotating dogs. So I live in what's called a crate and rotate system. So for a long time, I was in about a six quote unquote pack rotation. So different groups of dogs can get along with each other in different contexts and those dogs can go out at certain times. So I rotate dogs around my house every half hour to an hour all day long. How do you do that with ADHD? I love my timers. It helps <laughs> me with my, that's the only way I can tell time. My shepherd yeah. barks every 30 minutes. Yeah. He's my time clock. Okay. So the only way to deal with this, because this aggression, I mean, it's just, it's in their DNA, right? Some well, dogs. So are- I had missed the boat. I had multiple females that were not altered. So they were mm-hmm. still intact and in heat. Mm-hmm. And they're in what's called, I call it the socialization shit zone. So <laughs> the part of their socialization journey where they go through adolescence, that crappy zone from like nine months to 18 months old is when you'll see reactivity or dog aggression appear. Yep. Um, I, yep. Yep. And that's usually, I like to compare it right to human side. Um, teenage boys, they're strong, but they have no idea how much trouble they can get themselves into. Yes, exactly. Same thing, right? But if they're in that adolescence phase and one of, if they get traumatized, meaning a dog scares them and they have decided that they are scared of dogs, oh. now you have a dog reactive dog who's fearful. If you have a dog oh my in gosh. that state. Wait, 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 right. wait, wait. So right. what you just said, so- It's as little as them getting scared of a dog during that period of time that that's trauma for them. And so then they never trust dogs. Depending on if you have a soft or a hard dog and how big my human's response is. Mm -hmm. If I have a little puppy who's walking and gets scared of another dog and my puppy whimpers, most humans are going to go, oh my gosh, and pick our puppy up. Oh. Look how big of a deal we just made that. Mm -hmm. Now that's back in memory. Some... They used to believe that it was reinforcing the fear, but science is having a whole debate on it. You can't really reinforce an emotion. Mm -hmm. Um, But the way I like to say it is it creates a bigger loop. So it becomes a baseline of, I saw a dog, mom got scared, therefore dogs are scary because they're context learners. Oh my gosh, because you're, you're like their alpha. Well, yeah. So you're their filter on the world is the way I like to look at it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you're scared and you're the big one who's taking care of them- you know, mm-hmm. you're the mom, mm-hmm. then it reinforces the fact that they're scared. Correct. Freeze. They go in through the, they do the same freeze or fight, right? Yeah. They do one of the two. Same thing for dogs. And depending on how often we practice this behavior, right? So dog gets scared of other dogs. What's most humans next move? Go to dog parks, expose them to a bunch of dogs all the time. So now oh we're flooding God. them. Oh my God. I feel so bad, Renee. So you know That's what I, I did? That's how I felt when I first learned. I know. <laughs> What I, what I did, my husband and I were going, I don't know, it was some business trip. We had to go down to LA. Now she's older, but this was kind of, well, we were still in COVID, but we thought we were out of COVID. So it was last summer, yeah. right? Uh-huh. And um, we were going for, we went down to LA and I was going to have her stay with my parents, which is what she normally does. And instead I sent her to a, um, it was a boarding place. Mm-hmm. with a bunch of dogs mm-hmm. for four days. Mm-hmm. And that's when it got really bad. So she hadn't been around any dogs, really, other than right. probably some dog that scared her that I don't remember when she was younger. Or even and just no exposure. In- it's a bunch of aliens. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I feel but that's so terrifying. <laughs> um, and it happens like that, especially with our COVID dogs. So I'm actually working on slowly um, a course for COVID Mm -hmm. dogs specifically for online for folks, because these COVID dogs are having far more intense responses to things. 
than previous generations of breeds. Yeah. So um, you know what the um, the uh, boarding company told me? Actually, I don't think it was this boarding company. I think it was another one. And I don't know. Someone had to, you know, because I wasn't planning on boarding her again. Right. Um, what they told me is that all of their dogs that they had, you know how they do that kind of like meet and greet to make mm-hmm. sure that the dog can be at the boarding facility? Yeah. Well, apparently they had to redo all of them because they would bring these dogs back and they were like completely different dogs after COVID. It's a very real thing, right? Because dogs didn't get the benefit of the news. They don't know what COVID was. All they know is all of a sudden humans got weird. We all got grumpy. The kids started (laughs) staying home from school. Everybody was loud. And then now we're going back to this place. All of a sudden, I forgot all of those tools. They had to learn a whole bunch of new regulating tools. Mm -hmm. So these COVID brains, right? What happens between puppyhood and adolescence is they have branches of the brain, like the neural pathways that are literally falling off and then they're reconnecting other places. Yeah. So if during the fall off period and the reconnect happen and there's two very different learning histories, your dog now has conflicted feelings. So dogs that it's super common now for dogs to appear to want to greet you, you go to touch them and then they bite you on their way out. Yeah. <laughs> right. I call it the, uh, the cheap shot or like oh they really gosh. want the food, but they don't actually want you. And they overcommit to these social situations with humans frequently now because they don't mm. know how to leave. They forget that that's an option. Nine times out of 10, if I have a reactive dog, it's because that dog doesn't know it can just leave. It's never been given a button to leave. So that was my big question. So when you're dealing with a person, right, who's, you know, uncomfortable in social situations, Mm -hmm. you can give them skills, let's say just like an ADHD person, right? Mm -hmm. They can learn how to pause. They can learn how to ask themselves, is that really true? So that they feel more in control. Mm -hmm. Can you actually do that for a dog where they feel like they're more in control? Yeah, it's called adding agency. Um, I do a lot of it through enrichment, actually. So let's say I have a dog that is spatially sensitive things that are coming down on them or they have to pass through things scares them. Mm -hmm. I'm going to set them up where they have to go do a sniffing pad because what we have to remember the way humans regulate is different than how dogs regulate. Dogs regulate their nervous system with sniffing, scratching, digging. They do the big body shakes, big yawns. They regulate Mm -hmm. differently. So you have to send them to do those things. But if you cue them, then it's just a training loop. They have to want to do it themselves while in the presence of a low level stimulus. So again, (laughs) they're really similar to us in that if there's interest, right? Yep. Versus being told what to do, we get Uh defiant. Yep. (laughs) I love it. That's, you know, everybody calls them a stubborn dog. No, it's a dog who doesn't know how to, most of the time I have dogs that I work with where the whole training process is making the human understand that their dog wants to train them. And we just harness that. Why fight that? If the dog wants to train you, cool. For example, the mailman. It's my favorite example to use. Why does your dog bark at the mailman? Well, if the dog is barking and the mailman leaves, that dog is reinforced that they moved that mailman. (laughs) They got the cheeseburger. They got the payday. If we go back to the root purpose of why a shih tzu would be barking at the window, shih tzus are not attack dogs. So that's why you're not getting a dog running out there biting. Shih tzus are alert dogs. So what your dog wants you to do is come over, look out the window, and literally say, I see it. Thank you. And walk away calmly. If you throw some kibble in another room and go sit back down, nine times out of ten, your dog will stop barking and calm down immediately. They literally just want you to acknowledge the thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you shouldn't be yelling at them. Correct, because then you're barking with them. Think about it that way. This is absolutely hilarious, except for I'm doing everything wrong. That's how I felt. I do sometimes pick her up and I'll pet her and I'll uh-huh. be like, look at the nice federal express right, man. Right. <laughs> and then you go into baby talk, which baby talk itself is a trigger because baby talk is a learning history of engagement. So now you're telling her that person might touch her. Okay, wait, explain that. Explain that again. Okay, so dogs are context learners. They don't understand English. So it's... They, they don't? Do, <laughs> I know. They understand the tone, the pitch, and the speed. Okay. So, for example, if I have a really scared dog and I talk to them in that baby voice, that high-pitched, oh, come here, sweetie. (laughs) 
their learning history with people talking them to like that is that that person's going to touch them. That that voice change is a cue that they are going to be touched in a way that they don't have a choice over. Okay. Which increases the anxiety. Even if it's like their mom? Even if it, well, if there's a relationship there, that's fine. But if the mom does a high pitched voice and looking at the mailman, you don't have a a clear greeting protocol or a leave protocol. So she's just kind of stuck in the middle and it's becoming a very large deal. (laughs) Okay. So as you're sitting here talking, I can understand why someone with ADHD would be so good at what you do because it's all strategy and figuring out and testing, right? Yep. Yep. That's why I said like this field. And the other thing is there are so many different specialties. There are people who spend their whole lives never touching an aggressive dog. That would be me. And that's fine. They have a whole other side of the world for that, like for the dog training world. There's a spectrum of different types of trainers. There's a whole debate. I'm not even going to open that can of worms. But my point is, if you're like, when I found it, I never lose that interest. I never lose a hyper focus. Every new case I can find a webinar on and go down and learn something new. It's the perfect gig for me. Ah, I get to well- learn forever. And the thing about it, Renee, is it's so intense, which right. keeps your focus, right? Exactly. There's so much at, at risk, you know, um, which is why I switched most of my stuff to virtual, actually, because doing virtual intakes is far safer for everybody. <laughs> and so the way you would work with that is, yeah, I, I think for, for an aggressive dog, and then you put together kind of a strategy with them about what they're going to try first, second, and third, and then you guys come back and see what works, what doesn't work? Yeah, kind of. So they give me a history form usually because we have a lot of bites to talk about and I need to know what the dog's body language looks like and break down their learning history. And then I give them three things to start on and then we circle back in about a week. And from there, again, we attract our own people. So the majority of my clients are ADHD also, Uh huh. <laughs> um, which means they need creative solutions, right? Other trainers are going to tell you to do a five-minute walk here, a 10-minute walk there twice a day at this time. That's not realistic in an ADHD lifestyle. No. But what is, is habit stacking. If I can prep a Kong while I'm making my morning breakfast, my dog will always have enrichment in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. So you're, it's interesting, especially if you're working with people with ADHD, you are actually kind of coaching them, right? Uh-huh. Around the strategies that they can employ, kind of trying you know, well, I mean, do you focus on what has worked for them in the past? Kind of. Yeah. So actually one of my questions is talking about what the dog's reinforcers are. So I like to know what the dogs, I call it their learning style is, right? Are they chewers? Are they shredders? Do they like to investigate things? And then from there, I find out what's reinforcing for my human. Do you like sitting still? What do you like your dog doing? Great. Now let's combine those and do a training plan. So talk to me about learning style. That's so interesting for a dog. (laughs) Yeah. So it's kind of like how they have different breeds, right? Different breeds are going to have different tendencies. Uh, Mm -hmm. Chihuahua is going to have very different chewing tendency than a German shepherd, (laughs) right? Um, When a pit bull approaches a tug toy, he's going to react to it very differently than a greyhound. A greyhound is going to want to chase it. A pit bull is going to want to tug on it and shred it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of their learning style because there's part of the sequence that their breed held on to that's naturally reinforcing for them. So just okay. doing the activity is a payday. Okay. So that's the and learning so style. And so one of the things I noticed with my dog that I've never noticed with any other dog that I've owned is, I hate to say owned, they, they like <laughs> owned me. <laughs> I understand. Um, <laughs> but she always has her nose on the ground. It is almost impossible to walk her. I mean, she's 14 pounds, but she's tugging all over. It's ridiculous. And part of it is because she's always, you know, her nose is like in all the other dogs pee. And I mean, it's just really (laughs) gross. What is the deal with that? So you've already told me your dog is anxious. And Uh now you're telling me your dog sniffs everything, which means she is attempting to get more information about her surroundings to calm her anxiety. And the whole time we're giving her tension saying no. Oh, so reframe. All right. What uh-huh. we do is we put it on cue. We put a sniff on cue and a come back to me on cue. So we tell her when she can investigate. 
Okay. So we stop three places on the walk every single time and throw some kibble on the ground and say, go sniff. Now she doesn't want to sniff everywhere else because she knows she's going to get her sniffing moment. Okay. And so she's even more anxious because she wants to sniff. You know, someone right. once told me, and it, this was a, actually, this was a woman, I called her my friend, the tiger trainer, because she literally, <laughs> she trained, you know, wild cool. animals. Yeah. And her comment when I was complaining about this, <laughs> and I think I was complaining, no, this was with my bulldog buster, very, very stubborn dog. Uh-huh. And she said that it's kind of like the newspaper for some dogs. Yeah. It's how they, you know, figure out what's going on in the world. Mm-hmm. It's how, where do you go if you don't know what to do? We Google something. It's their uh-huh. Google. <laughs> they say, I don't, I don't know what that is. Let me sniff it. And that's actually a sign of a dog who's attempting to regulate. That's a sign of a dog who's still willing and engaged and is not in learned helplessness, which means you're doing something right. It means that your timing is a little off because okay. a dog that's shut down and not even willing to sniff is a totally different dog. I have yeah, to teach this a lot is of ridiculous. dogs how to sniff. I know. <laughs> this is why I love this job. That's why I said this is the perfect gig for ADHD. We can do anything we want over here. Okay, so I want to hear. Okay, l- wait, let me reframe and let me come up with a question. So, when we're talking about aggression and dogs, mm-hmm. is that actually like, do you have success stories about dogs that were a certain way and you're able to get them to, you know, they were re- aggressive and difficult and scary and you were able to move them to the point where they're, you know, really great members of the family and the actual person who, the human who has the dog, you know, their anxiety is like, they trust that dog now. Yeah, no, that's a huge piece for me. That's why I spend so much time on foundations. And that's honestly why I turned into a more of a Lima trainer, because when we use management tools to set my humans up for success, we can trust our dog faster. So for example, if I have a dog that's lunging and nipping at people, we're going to muzzle train that dog so that my human knows that everybody's safe and they can listen to me and learn. Uh, If I don't first address the human sphere, they can't learn either. Because dogs, I mean, they can feel that in us, right? Oh, yeah. Well, we hold on to the leash, right? My favorite cue, I'm actually doing leash reactivity this month in my group. Um, But instead of pulling on the leash, it's tight hand, loose leash. Mm -hmm. Instead of adding tension. Um, But success stories, there's, I mean, you have to have realistic expectations. Some of my dogs that we work, we are excited and ecstatic that they can go into the vet without biting anybody now with a muzzle Mm. on. That's a big deal. Oh, it's That's a, a huge deal. deal. I can't even imagine. Yeah, I worked never a had to case worry about in, that. Oh, yeah. I worked a case out in New York where the dog would start becoming aggressive like two exits before they got off the highway. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we worked virtually through all of the counter conditioning and he can go in and get a full examination now. There was a case out here recently where I, I told them we weren't going to make very much progress. I would rather undersell my human than set them up. Um, it was a, a bulldog, Marshall. He, over a dozen human bites in the house. He'd only oh been family members. He was deaf. I mean, like the last bite he had bitten and hung on to the lady and wouldn't let go. Oh my God. And so, did it get progressively worse as he got older? Correct. It was just getting worse and worse. And so they yeah. found me finally and we started working and we gave him agency. He's a great example of a dog that just needed some agency and some warning. So because he was deaf, he didn't know when people coming out of the rooms. So we started uh, light training him. Light means somebody's going to engage with you. When you see this person, it means food is going to appear behind you. That way you can't charge at the gate. Okay, wait, wait. So, uh, explain that again. It's called light training? Yeah, so uh, it's pretty common with the deaf dogs. So they understand they have almost like a, an early warning system, just like you would with a deaf human, right? If their mm-hmm. alarm goes off, they need a light, not a sound. Okay. Same thing for a dog. I just translated it over. So are you saying you, like you use a flashlight? No, like the hall light. Oh, you turn just on the light. On the light Duh, sorry. You, just turn on the light. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But we made a ton of progress and we could figure out one tiny little piece. The dog kept having random reactivity during the day. You want to mm-hmm. know what the biggest thing was and why I, this is why I train my humans to think like me. That's how I know I've done my job right. Is they, they messaged me one day and they said, we figured out what his problem was. Their AC vent was directly above his area. And when it would kick on during the day, it would scare him. Uh. So they put a wind diverter on it. And I mean, gone. We have gone, I think we're at six months with not even growling at a human. Huh. Right. 
And for five years, they lived terrified of their dog. Well, and I, I can't believe they lived for five years. I mean, I, I know. take my hat off to those people. Me too. <laughs> Me too. I don't, I don't advocate my lifestyle. I don't advocate people having to keep dangerous dogs. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to keep a dangerous dog, you need to commit to the training too. You know what I mean? And there's a, a piece of that where I find a lot of my clients also have, we have heavier connections to things. So we need a little bit more support and pulling ourselves away. Like I trained my dogs to fight by accident because I loved them so much. (laughs) Wait, say that again? Right. So when I first started my journey with my guys and I was still trying to get them to integrate, anytime they would see each other and they would posture, so get really stiff and stare at each other, (gasps) I would react by saying no, right? Because stop that, go away from each other. As a human, I feel better if you do nothing here. Yes. That became a cue for a fight. Okay, so I, I get what you're saying. You trained them not intentionally. Not intentionally. But you, tra- yeah, you created this dynamic. Because I created the button. The button mm. to get space from each other is get into a fight and then I'll separate you. Instead of just, oh. hey, look at me, give me a different start button and I can get you out of the room. Wow. That's where that comes in. I wonder with that bulldog too, if the reason he wasn't so extra grumpy was having that you know, air conditioning bent down, down on him the whole time. Yep. Yep. And like, you can't piece it out until you can get the dog to somewhat of a baseline. Mm. I think bulldogs though, they're so, they're so phlegmatic. Like they don't seem to care about anything, but when they care, they just do. N- well, I guess they were bred to take down bulls, right? That's what the, yeah. The wrinkles on their face were so they didn't suffocate so that the blood could drain off their oh, faces. <laughs> Oh, but they were also bred um, as nanny dogs in, in the UK, right? Because Which... they are wonderful at protecting what they love. Ah. And we can't okay. get mad at them for protecting things if that's their natural instinct. My shepherd, that fence is his. He used to get in fights with my dogs at the fence because what's a shepherd going to do when they see something new? New translates to bad for working breed brain. Wow. So he's going to handle it because... Dogs like bulldogs that and shepherds. sounds shepherd. like a neurotypical brain. Right. Dogs like shepherds Neuro and bulldogs. Bad. Yes. We train them to see a threat and not ask permission first, just go handle it. Mm. That's what we bred them for. So if we want to train them, we have to back it up and create what I call like a, a moment of hesitation where they can have a thought and use a different option. Wow. This is so fascinating. Okay. So- do you only work with aggressive dogs or if like I wanted to work with you and Mo, could I work with you? Yeah. Yeah. So I work aggression, reactivity and anxiety. Um, They're probably kind of go hand in hand, huh? Yeah. (laughs) They kind of get mixed up sometimes, but I have another trainer I work with Jade who she takes on any of the other stuff. So she does cooperative care handling. She's teaching dogs how to offer a behavior so that the vet can do a blood draw without anything. Mm. So she does a lot of obedience and trick training stuff for me too. And she does some behavior work also. We need help with grooming too. She hates, yep. to, but she hates to go to the groomer because of all the friggin' dogs, right? Right. Well, and a dog like that probably needs a licky mat and maybe looking at a scratch board. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. So yeah, I think I definitely need to work with you. I just, <laughs> she is such a love. She is like, you know, when you, I've never had a dog before that, I mean, they're not totally hypoallergenic, but. You know, she's so clean. I mean, she's They're in my companion bed. companion animals. They want to be oh. in your space all the time. That's why they said a trick up your sleeve. That used to be a small dog up a traveler's sleeve. <laughs> really? Yes. Oh, my gosh. You are just, uh, you're, you're just a wealth of knowledge. Amazing. And I just, I just love that I can see how the ADHD is so present in what you do. Yeah. That's what you know, I like about it. The ADHD is almost celebrated in this side. Absolutely. So tell us, what do you think it is about you and your ADHD that makes you so good at this? We kind of touched uh, on it, but what do you think? I think it would probably be my hyperactivity and my spatial awareness, seeing everything all of the time. If your brain moves 100 miles an hour all the time, you can see a lot more. Ah. Uh, and what do you think are the ADHD traits that are responsible for your success? Probably that hyperfixation and honestly, the memory. <laughs> if I don't have to remember a whole bunch of stuff and I can work on a list and a timer, I'm set. Yeah. 
Yeah. Cause you're just all in when yep. you're working. Right. But then you yep. can let it all go. Yep. There's no follow-up really. Right. Do you have a number one ADHD workaround? I think I know what you're going to tell me. <laughs> I love my timers. <laughs> yeah. I love my timers, but also since I started listening to your podcast, of course, I've learned about delegating, but not just like delegating work stuff. So uh, for example, I hired a cleaning lady who ended up helping me reorganize my whole home mm. into ADHD friendly systems, right? She didn't even realize I had ADHD. She was just like, oh, you want your stuff there? Great. We can just move it around and help you make that a system. Don't okay. And I want you, did you fight against hiring someone to help you in the home? 110%. The only reason I did it is because I went down for hip surgery last October, actually. <laughs> you were forced to do it. Right. So <laughs> I had no choice. And what happened? I want you to really, you know, I, share Everybody with needs listeners. to do it. I know. I listened to you say it and I, everybody needs to do it. And the great thing is my cleaning lady, I've talked about her so much. Now she has a virtual side of her business because everybody works with her. She's so awesome. Wow. Like, get somebody who, when I, when I was looking for a cleaning person, I didn't want somebody that would just clean my house. I can just clean my house. I yep. needed somebody that could come in and do the stuff I couldn't do. So that doom day room, that room that has all the crap that I really think I want, but I have no idea what to do. All of those previous hobbies and stuff. She can sit there and we do it in 10 minute chunks and we just put one thing a little way and we move yeah. on. It's yeah. awesome. That uh, so delegate. So I guess your cleaning lady must like dogs. She does. Yeah, actually, she's good. All of my dogs like her, too. Uh, my dogs are all finally human friendly. So that is nice. I don't have any more human aggressive dogs in the house. <laughs> yeah, well, with a child, I guess that makes it, you know, even more important, yeah. right? Yeah, I've got four year old and two year old. They're babies. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> You're just taking care of everybody and everything. Can't help it. Also, yeah. another one is learning the tools that you need. So like, I didn't have a reinforcement history with delayed gratification, right? Or immediate satisfaction humans. So I started aquariums because you have to let it sit for three weeks to cycle. You have to learn. And now it's become a sensory outlet for me. Aha. Uh -huh. Wonderful. So Renee, um, where can people find you if they want to know more about you and what you do? So I'm all over the place. You can find me on Facebook. I run a group called Human End of the Leash. We just broke 1,200 members. Um, yeah. I go live once a month. We have all kinds of content in there. My admin's awesome. She'll connect you to whatever resources you need. I also have a podcast that we started. Um, it's called What's Dog it called? Life Dog Life with No Spoons. Wait, say it again? <laughs> Dog Life with No Spoons. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And did you tell us what your website is? It's streetdogrehab.com. Wonderful. So we're going to have all of that in the show notes. Yes. And you guys will get a discount too. It's the, the coupon is no spoons. it will get 5% off. Aw. Well, thank you, Renee. Thank you so much for spending time with us here today. I just found this whole conversation fascinating. Thank you. I had a really good time too. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So that's what I have for you for this week. Look, if you like this episode with Renee, please let us know by leaving a review. Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too may discover their amazing strengths. And you know what? Your reviews really help in that regard. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. Come join me over at tracyoutsuka.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is A OK -okay system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.